Thank you. Um, okay. Last night, um, um, look, we all got a whole bunch of routers out there and we're in trouble um, because we're kind of exposed. Um, Rob will hopefully sing a little on this subject, but what's the threat model to our BGP speaking routers? And I would contend it's first one's configuration error. If you remember the good old 7007 incident or the 128 slash 8 incidents where, you know, major providers were taken out for days. Um, there's the traffic diversion attacks um, related to Steve's work, and he'll tell you a little about that. There's um, distant database attacks, source spoofing, um, to try and get my router to do stupid things. There's DDoS to, um, again, traffic diversion force path. I believe we also need to protect against monkey in the middle and wiretap attackers and people who wear funny clothes and live near Washington, D.C. are pretty strong about that. And I believe that I don't want an interim solution that I'm going to have to rebuild my network all over again with a second solution later. But I do want to strongly make the point that the danger we're talking about to your routers and to my routers is not theoretical. Um, it's stuff that is happening and has happened. As long as two years ago, um, I know of a backbone that I worked on where it was owned for at least six hours. The only reason we detected it was somebody, one of the miscreants, touched a configuration and the sweeper that watches configurations every hour caught it. So um, this is not a theoretical sign. This is real. Your routers and my routers and the working internet are seriously threatened. Okay, this, this, this picture was a road just a week and a half before this picture was taken. You don't want this to be your network. Maybe you do. Um, so um, if you remember in February 2000, at the last hotel where the water was so soft it took you a half an hour to get the soap off you in the shower, like this one, um, Steve described, first described um, DDoS attacks. As he was speaking, the first major attacks on big sites occurred. Let's hope that today we don't uh, re-experience that. There are essentially two proposals, um, each poorly documented, um, wandering around the ITF space for solving this problem. One of them is SBGP by Steve Kenton crew at BBN, um, which Steve Bellavin will characterize for us. The other is SO signed origin BGP, um, which Alvaro will characterize for us, that's uh, floating around um, the valley. Um, First, we're going to hear a little from Dave and Andrew on um, operators' views of this. And then I'm going to try to sum up with where I think my personal prejudice is where we can go forward in a compromise. Unfortunately, neither of the two things are all, they're all relying on expired hyphen zero zero drafts. There is no current solid work on these protocols. Um, and we'll get you some detail later. I'm going to toss the time to Steve. You want to plug your laptop in, Steve? Here, I'll get rid of this one. pictures or any nice pictures like that, but I can say that I, I'd, if I had a network, I'd want it to be on Hawaii. 
Um, okay, this is a work in progress between Andrew, I, and everyone else in this room, so um, it's supposed to be interactive. Um, I've gotten a lot of information from all of you as I've been building these, as we've been building these slides, so stand up and talk anytime you want, including that includes Andrew. So in, in looking at this, um, uh, Andrew and I were tasked with kind of coming up with what our operator hat perspective looked like. So here's the agenda we came up with. First, uh, trying to get, oh, by the way, how much time do we have right here? You know? All right. Okay. Um, we wanted to try to characterize the problems we were trying to solve, um, then ask the question, why aren't we deploying one of these two or other, um, or other solutions? What are the complexity issues? And what's the 10,000 mile view that we're looking for anyway? And maybe if we have some time for discussion, we'll do that. And these slides, if anybody should happen to want them, are there. Um, if somebody wants the, and, uh, the magic point source, I can give you that too. So here's the, here's the um, view of the problems we're trying to solve. As Randy pointed out, there's a lot of threat mo uh, model work going on, including trying to characterize configuration mistakes, prefix hijacking, compromised backbone routers, DDoS availability, some new attacks like the one that Steve um, and his co-author um, just published about using link cutting techniques. And then, of course, there's the whole set uh, of the th that are new and, and things that we haven't seen or detected yet. So a lot going on here. And um, I showed these slides to Rob Thomas, just hoping you know to get some feedback. And here's the first thing he gave me. He basically said, um, "This is real life and something that we really need to be looking at right now with some with some, um, as Randy said, with some uh, urgency." So, um, in case you were wondering. Hijacking and ownage is is a big problem for us right now. So, if we if we look at this as, and, and we go well, okay, we have these huge problems. Why aren't we deploying some kind of secure BGP right now? Well, as Randy pointed out, there are two kinds of works in progress on this: uh, secure BGP and secure origin BGP. And the question that came to mind is, well, why aren't we deploying either of these? Well, the first one is. It um, doesn't appear that there's any con community consensus on what the right solution to this is right now. These are proposals, and as Randy said, they're, they're works in progress in various states of uh, documentation. Danny. Danny. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I can okay, hear. so I'd actually be can happy you? to see. Who are you, and can you uh, speak up yeah. a little bit? <laughs> Danny McPherson. Uh, I'd be happy to see inter-provider route filters less I don't know all this stuff so. okay we'll get to that thank you okay so so as Danny points out there's no community consensus on this um, there's a complexity issue here and we'll get to there that in a second but and there's also sort of a paradox trade-off as there always is with complexity but in security in the security area it's it's sort of acute and this is the quote I like from from Steve when I was trying to write about complexity um, and what it meant for security and whatever RFC 3439 or whatever that thing was, he said this, um, which is true. So we're, we're, we're kind of have a paradox here, uh, or at least a trade-off that we have to be cognizant of that we're making. So what about the complexity aspects of this? Well, both, both S, SBGP and SOBGP seek to protect different parts of the routing system via cryptographic means, but there are some common things that we can talk about. They both want to protect allocation of IP addresses and AS numbers, of course, um, and in some cases uh, protect grant the granting authority for the chunks of address space that are out there and for the BGP messages and peerings. Um, this is one of the places where SOBGP, and I think Alvaro will probably talk about this, but um, this is one of the places where they diverge because SBGP seeks to really protect the entire end-to-end -end system where the S, uh, SOBGP authors um, take this as a, part, a different part of the same, an overall problem. So in general, you might want to authenticate every step in the life cycle of an IP ad allocation of an IP address and how it's used. Um, from the IANA, from one ISP to another, to the customer, the, to the AS number allocations, to permitting an AS to originate right, routes for some address space. And in general, all BGP traffic, including uh, AS paths, which would protect against some of the things that Randy was mentioning, next hops, all of it. So I was talking to Rob about this again, and here's what he said. I, I just find these kind of interesting because he, he injected some pragmatism into the whole thing, and basically he was saying that, you know, um, 
you know, so many routers don't have ACLs on their VTYs, much less all of this other stuff. So if it's hard to do simple, how can we do complex? So that's something to keep in mind. So all of that stuff is out there floating around with the uh, designers of both of these protocols and with the operators, but what's our 10,000 mile view? What do we want out of all of this? Well, I think we can agree that almost every BGP speaker should be able to verify that the address space has been properly allocated, that the AS origin AS is valid, that the, this is what we're, well, the entire AS path being valid is one of the ones that we'd like, but we're not sure. That's, that's a point of contention. Um, other attributes, and in this case I was thinking about, because I've had VPN, BGP signaling for VPN on, the mind, on my mind for a while, and so I was wondering, well, if you're going to do this on um, IPv4 and LRI, are you going to do it on IPv4 VPN LRI or L2 VPN and LRI? And in, and in addition to that, is that too small? I don't know. In addition to that, are there security or even other implications of continuing to throw almost everything into BGP? What does it all mean? So the thing to note is that that there are cryptographic signatures that will be needed that will need to be checked and verified at various steps at different places for the different um, for the different um, uh, approaches. But at at the ten thousand at the ten thousand mile, we probably like to have a system that would do all these things for us. But all of this comes at a price, and of course that price is um, operational complexity and additional infrastructure. So. What can or should we do? So here's here's one, here's one of Andrew, this was one of Andrew's ideas. How about pre-collecting all of the information into a local database and uh, running an authentication checker there? Only send the router pre-compiled chunks of uh, data instead of everything. So these are incremental approaches that we've been thinking about. But the router still needs additional processing and memory to be able to handle all this. So that's something to think about into the future. And it's still unclear how big this information would need to be or how much of how much of that information a router would need to carry around. And um, it, and one of the things that, of course, we're always concerned about is introducing new dependencies into the routing system that would make it either converge or recover more slowly. And so that's something to think about. So continuing on what we might do, the point of a point of all of that discussion is that there's a non-trivial amount of infrastructure that we need to support to do this databases, certificate authorities, all of that stuff. What's the effect on BGP convergence? We don't know. Here's, here's the one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Who pays for all this? Because as we know, CapEx and OpEx is kind of the frontier for the carriers these days. And there are also free market issues, like what's to stop a user who um, from moving to lower cost ISPs who don't provide this service and in fact, would this, would this generate a new kind of uh, no SLA service? And if it did, what would that mean for the system in general as a whole, the routing system of the global internet? So how about administrative delays? This is something that came up earlier that um, is, this gonna t is this gonna inject time in, um, into getting a prefixed announce, which people, getting a prefix announce, which people seem to be unhappy about as it is. Um, well, for SOBGP, um, Signatures and certificates have to be generated in the same way as with SBGP, but the propagation of the information is different. And instead of re relying on out-of-band databases and some form of synchronization, the certificates are advertised in a new message, the security message. So this thing should have propagation um, uh, delays and timings that look like update propagation. So in theory, um, SBGP won't add any administrative delay to getting your prefix announced. Your prefix announced in theory. How about SBGP? By the way, do people see that as an issue, time from when you get an allocation to when it can be announced? Avi, can you go to the microphone and um, tell who you are and all of that good stuff? Yes, you can go to the microphone and tell who you are and all of that good stuff, or yes to some other question. Yes, I do think it's important. Also, one of the, given that SBGP or SOBGP or other competing proposals, which may or may not exist yet, um, will not be completely deployed across the internet initially, 
one of the defenses when someone is actually trying to attack your space or hijack it is to, at least even for your own space, announce it more specifically. And being able to do at least that, I think, is important. Um, and if there are places where, uh, you know, it, it, when you have a split model where some people are not running any, any you know, advanced protocol and some people are, I think you need to be able to react pretty quickly to that. Um, also, I work with some providers where we've had customers who had legitimate need to announce new address space pretty quickly. Well taken. Well, okay, so let's let's look at what we think might happen with SBTP. Of course, this is all hypothetical, right, because we don't have it. But So the question is, will it take a new address, will it take longer to get a new address routed if we have SBGP out there? And the, 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 the answer to that is maybe, and why, is because of uh, the fact that all the signatures involved have to be generated, signed, published to local database and pushed around in various ways that are not necessarily congruent with the update um, topology. And so the question we have on this one is, are we willing to make that trade-off as a community or as individual providers? It's a question that needs to be answered. So finally on all of this, sort of finally, um, if you think about the additional processor and memory storage needed on a router, at least for SBGP, um, it's going to cost somebody something. And again, back to who pays for this? Are we going to raise the price of the service? How's this going to work? And I, I think Randy has some thoughts on that. We talked about that earlier. Um, there's an alternative, an alternate or alternative position on the, on this that maybe um, goes to what Danny was saying earlier, which is. How much of this problem can be solved by current by currently deployed techniques, you know, like BTSH, ingress filtering, unicast, I think I have pointers to this for those who don't know what they are, uh, unicast RPF and maybe cleaning up the registry systems and things like that. How much of the window could we close? It's a question that needs to be answered. And if we could, would it be enough? How would we define enough? And for how long would it be enough? So the question is, is this an incremental could we do something incremental in the in the sense of incremental like Randy was describing, or would this just be the band-aid and then we'd throw this away when we got something better? There's a lot of opinions on this one out there. I'd be interested in what people have to say about that. So trying to get some final thoughts through here. What are the cost-benefit trade-offs we're looking at? Those are really difficult, and so far we I, don't, I haven't seen any real uh, quantification of that. If anybody has thoughts or ideas on that, please step up and tell us about it. Um, is there an incremental deployment model? We think there might be with with both of these. In the case of SBGP, we might be able to start with just signing the origins and then over time build up uh, forward signed AS paths or something like that. And you know, it's important to note that SBG, SOBGP has a different model where it doesn't sign updates, but instead it has the uh, certificates and the security message. Oh yeah, and of course, you know, um, if you ever wanted to write a, a draft about this and have it go through the I-STAR, you'd have to deal with this last thing, um, which I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, how much trouble that causes. So finally, um, the reading on this, um, as Randy said, the, these documents are all kind of in various state of, of decay, and uh, this is where they are if you want to look, look at them. I, I highly advise reading both of them. So the question becomes, what are the next steps for the operator community on all of this? Just sit here, try to deploy one of these, try to find a new model, try to make them all come together, where to go? That's the question that we really need to answer. Mr. Rob, breaking news. Uh-oh. Hi, everybody. Rob Thomas. Those of you who know me know the hardest thing I will ever do is stand still at a microphone. But I will try. So we're talking about... Yes, sir. <laughs> See, we have the technology. We can rebuild him. Jerry Springer begin. So we're talking about BGP threats, and one of the problems we have is that there are still people out there, the unbelievers, who don't think this is a real threat. So I've got breaking news for all of you. How many of you have routers that speak BGP? What a crowd, what a crowd. I'm going to teach you 
how to own any BGP speaking router. Ready to take notes? Because it's going to stay in the room, right? Okay, here it goes. Are you ready for the command? It's one command. <laughs> Bang. B. G. P. S. Enter. That's it. This is how the miscreants get your routers. People will compromise routers that speak BGP. They will target them, by the way. And then they will make them available in the underground economy. And to get one of those, it is as simple as typing bang, B, G, P, S in certain channels, and out comes a router IP. What do you suppose the password is? Cisco. C1, S, C0, that one always stops them. The point here is that routers are being owned on a massive scale, and routers that speak BGP have an even higher value. By the way, for those of you who are going to go shopping for your own routers after this, some of those vending bots require a valid credit card. How many of you think the miscreants use their own? The point I'm trying to drive home is, if you think this is not a threat, I'd like to know your AS number. <laughs> this is a very real threat. It's very real in the underground. They're taking advantage of it today and have been for quite a long time. Quick thought. Why would anybody want a BGP speaking router? Well, Rob wants them because they're cool. But they want them for a variety of reasons. Spammers pay big money, and when I say money, I mean real money. Not credit cards, not shells, not other routers, not proxies. Because they will use BGP speaking routers to announce allocated yet unadvertised space to figure out if anybody will squawk. How many of you think you would notice if somebody announced a more specific prefix under your prefixes? Oh, Abby, put your hand down. We knew that. This is the thing they'll do. Think they're not subscribed to Nanog? Yeah. So once they figure out that space doesn't cause any pain, any squawking, they will then turn around and use it to generate spam. So those of you who've been Joe Job, not just of your domain, but perhaps of your prefix, now you know how it happens. By the way, there are people who call themselves IP brokers who will do the same thing, pay some miscreant to announce a net block seen by squawks, then they'll turn around and sell, quote unquote, that net block to very naive providers. Dude, I really need a slash 16. I can help you. The low, low price of. I've got some swamp space to sell you. <laughs> yeah. So the very quick point, and I'm never quick, that I'm trying to make is that this is a very real threat. But it doesn't take much to raise the bar. Those of you who have Telnet open to the whole world, those of you who use Cisco or Cayman or whatever as a password, this is your wake-up call. It came too late. Your routers are probably already owned. So take the time to raise the bar, do the simple things, listen to what these fine, fine folks are saying, and get on board, because we're already behind. This isn't a case of let's beat them. We've been beaten. Now we need to recover. That's it. Rob, yes, so we raised the bar by cleaning up the stupid stuff um, um, and uh, you know, turn off Telnet on your sticking routers, et cetera, et cetera. Get some access lists in there. Um, how likely is it that the bad boys and girls are just going to follow the raised bar. Well, the underground is an amazingly adaptive place. So as we raise the bar, so will they. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that the underground is also an incredibly lazy place, by and large. So we, let's face it, folks, we've not challenged them. We've not made it difficult for them to do what they do. And by the way, now they're making real money doing what they do. They've got motive, right? They have customers to satisfy, just like all of us. So they will raise the bar, but we need to buy that time. We need to start excluding the simplest of miscreants. We need to make sure that you can't just type bang BGPS or bang Cisco or bang Cayman or bang anything else and get 20 of the things at one crack. To give you a feel for how bad it is, one bot I recovered, and this is uh, over a year and a half ago, included 3,400 compromised routers to be used by the bot as a proxy. 
all 3,400 worked. I didn't test it. I'm not like that. How many ASs? It was about 17. So, you know, if that was over a year and a half ago, what do you think it's like now? Much better, of course, Rob. So, again, keep in mind, this is a very real threat. Don't talk theoretical anymore. Those days are gone. And that ends my gloom and doom. I'll try to be quick. Three points. The simple thing to watch for that I've seen a lot is people who set up their own TAC servers. How many people run TAC? TAC X? Anyone? No? I guess I'm alone. Um, have you know the router people set them up because you wouldn't trust those IT people to touch a Unix machine and then haven't looked at the machines for two or three years. Um, so I would encourage people to consider regularly auditing those machines. Second point, we actually monitor for more specifics, change in origin AS, although we don't monitor uh, change in you know the middle of the AS path, about 20 different organizations, including all the Akamai deployments. And in the last year that we've been doing it, for we've seen, we've been monitoring about 3,500 prefixes. We've only seen one attack on a prefix that couldn't be attributed to a uh, couldn't be attributed to just a misconfig. Um, that doesn't mean that it can't be done, um, uh, but uh, it ha you know I think that's part of the problem is that it hasn't been done enough. It absolutely is happening, but not enough. Uh, third comment: I, I think that the you asked Dave what the provider community can do. I think be proactive um, is is a good thing. It's easy for me to stand there and be critical and say, SBGP is silly because no one's going to deploy off-board route processors, and no one's done simulation assuming paranoid levels of CPU load or BGP load, and the people who wrote it have never seen you know, routers operate and don't understand that 60% average load doesn't mean that you aren't often running at 100%. But trying to think about how to be constructive, and maybe it's educating the people who are working on the designs, or maybe you know, in terms of what you could realistically deploy, Maybe that's what the provider community can do. Um, so far, I've been a little bit stumped myself, but that's why we have so many smart people sitting around. So. I think the point that Rob's got, we shouldn't belabor too much. We should just, we needed Rob to make the point. This is a very real and very current problem. And it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. I don't think, I mean, one message I have is, should we be having a panel next time and a discussion of the basic stuff you should be doing to secure your routers today? Or tutorial? Um, um, I think that's a point. But I think we should focus the rest of the panel on here to long-term protocol strategies for trying to get strong crypto protection for what we're actually hearing in BGP. and and. You'll excuse me for being an idiot and just concentrating on that pretty much for the rest of the time. Steve? Want the one? Okay. I can I've got off. I, I, I can stand at least more still than Rob. Uh, yeah, so I'm we're talking about SBGP. I'm channeling Steve Kent here. Uh, the. Uh, Oops, I think I've got the wrong slides up. Yeah, I've got the wrong slides up. Excuse me for a second. Uh, Randy and Dave referred to this new attack of mine. You can find it on my webpage called the Link Cutting Attack. Basically, we demonstrated that it's computationally feasible, assuming you own a few links or routers, to calculate what other links you want to take out to force the traffic to go past the uh, nodes you can, or links you control. It's kind of an optimized backhoe attack. Uh, we demonstrated this with you know, real data from real internet topologies. You can find that on my webpage. The nasty thing about that attack is that's an attack that succeeds even after we have SPGP. So we can. Uh, but maybe more interested to the people who wear funny clothing around Washington when they want to go take out various unfriendly parties' links. There are problems with trying to do uh, secure BGP. The problems come from a lot of different spots. One of the simplest is configuration errors. But of course, if I'm off the air, I don't really care too much why I'm off the air. 
whether it's a configuration error or whether it's malice. I'm off the air. Another is you know, fraudulent origin. Someone who's got no deliberately announcing a route, originating a route that they have no right to do. This is what we're seeing today, what Rob is talking about. Fraudulent modification. Maybe someone in the middle of the net isn't modifying an AS path or announcing something that looks like a legitimate AS path, but it goes through some ASs that they control. And this is happening by compromised routers and by compromised administrative configuration systems. And the bad guys can get in, and in, in either place. It may be happening, especially with the more advanced threat models, by wiretapping and active packet injection. We don't know if that's happening as much. It could. That, by the way, is the, is the threat model things like the uh, TCP BG, uh, MD5 options designed to protect against. The basic model of SBGP, and I said I'm channeling Steve Kent here, is routing origin is digitally signed. When you get an address block, when you start announcing it, you have a certificate saying you have the right to this address block and you sign the route advertisement at the very beginning. The more interesting thing is that the updates are digitally signed. Each update you send out is digitally signed. There is an address-based PKI used to generate these certificates. If you, you, know, you get your addresses from the RIR or from your upstream or from your provider. When you get an address block, if you're a BGP speaker, they give you a certificate with it. There is no new trusted party in this. You're getting your certificate from the same party who's giving you your addresses, so there are no new trust paths. There is new software, there's a bit new procedure, but once this thing is in place, I don't think there's going to be any delay once we're in steady state on using this thing, because when you get the address block, you'll get the certificate along with it. The most important thing that happens is that the signing party says, signs a message saying, this is who the next hop on this AS path is. And this chain of signatures gets carried along with the BGP update messages throughout the net as an optional transitive attribute. Yes, this does expand the size of BGP messages. The steady state overhead is not actually not bad. It's the startup overhead that uh, can be expensive in terms of bandwidth. The certificates mostly live near each BGP speaker. You can send them in the BGP updates. Generally, you won't want to do that. But this is one thing you would want to do at startup when you get to start announcing a new prefix for a couple of days until the certificate has made it to the various repositories. You start sending it out with the updates. And this isn't a problem. Certificates are self-verifying. Uh, you don't need to trust the path by which you get a certificate. You could simply verify it. There are a lot of optimizations to the basic scheme. You can do lazy validation of routes. You can cache signed uh, route, so-called route attestations or address attestations. And if you've seen it before, you keep it. When things are flapping because topology is changing, you don't completely discard all knowledge of a particular uh, path. You mark it as not usable at the moment, but you keep it in your cache. When you see something new that comes by that same path, you look to see if you have a previously validated signed statement of that path. If so, you don't have to go through the expense of calculating the uh, digital signature verification again. Cost. Steady state overhead is estimated about 1.4 kilobits per second. Uh, the startup transient is worse because suddenly sounding out a lot more messages. It's not free, but it also doesn't look to be a killer. It does consume a fair amount of CPU. It would be a good idea to have crypto accelerators on board. It will consume a fair amount of extra RAM on the BGP speakers. Yes, this is going to be some expense. My own personal feeling, and I'm perfectly willing to be proved wrong, is that the cost of a crypto accelerator chip and a bit more RAM, this doesn't have to be the really fast RAM, by the way, is going to be fairly small compared to the cost of a GSR. It is not going to be a very big percentage increase in the cost. It could probably be folded into the regular update cycle because we're not rolling this thing out tomorrow. It's going to take years to deploy this thing, get people to do, start doing the signing, and 
My own personal guess is that the uh, ordinary upgrade rate, assuming the economy ever starts again, uh, will suffice to get this in place with a fairly small percentage cost. The real cost is the operational cost of maintaining this PKI, and for that matter, of cleaning up the address allocation records and issuing the initial certificates to start with. But any form of secure routing is going to have to go through that. We're going to have to cl clean up the databases and issue some form of public key credentials to people who own address blocks. The PKI is complex. You know, the latest paper from like Steve Kent and company is something only a PKI geek could love. But it's based on existing trust relationships and existing business relationships. And that's a very important point because this also means there's an existing authentication relationship. It doesn't do a great job of uh, handling withdrawals. I can't sign a withdrawal notice for a path when the link over which I would announce it is down, and that's why I have to go withdraw the route. This is kind of a fundamental limitation here. And I said, you do need router upgrades to do this in its full glory. TCP MD5 protects single hops against active intrusions on the wire. The uh, BGP TTL security hack protects against people who are uh, off link. These are good against certain kinds of attacks. They don't do any good against false origins or a subverted router in the middle of the network. And you know, that happens. SOBGP does a good job guarding against origination fraud. I don't think it would do as well against guarding, well, monkey business in the middle of the network. And none of this presents as an evil router that's on the legitimate path. Running code exists for SBGP based on uh, gate D. This web page, Steve Kent's got papers, talks, and code. Pick it up from there. I said, I'm channeling Steve Kent, so I will now try to go find a nice Cabernet or Burgundy. Questions? I just had a quick question. Could you describe uh, what would be the effect if, say, just the largest five to seven networks in the United States decided to put in place SPGP because they already have repositories, they have the technical staff and expertise? What would be the effect on the overall infrastructure? The most important thing is that people who want to trust this stuff would have to know authoritatively that certain pa address prefixes were supposed to be signed. After all, you can be a large company who's doing business with a small ISP for whatever reason, and maybe they're not doing it, so you suddenly start seeing a signed path for your large prefix coming from big ISP, and an unsigned path for a more specific prefix coming from a small ISP, and is that valid or is that someone trying to hijack one of your prefixes? And you have to have some authoritative way of knowing that all prefixes in a large block are supposed to be signed. It w As with many other things, it would tend to, if you did it that way, tend to concentrate loop. People who cared about security would go more for the big providers. I don't. I work for a big provider, uh, so I suppose I'd have to consider that good, but it would be an effect. But realistically, most prefixes are coming from, and most uh, addresses are coming from the big providers. We could go a long way to securing a lot of traffic if we were the big providers doing this. Of course, big providers are not immune to having router, <coughs> routers compromised either. That's happened too. It's not just something that happens to the little, you know, to the little guys. But yeah, this would help even if it's just the big providers. Um, one part of the answer to that is <coughs> maybe Steve's talk didn't make it quite as clear. One of the salient features of SBGP is that when Andrew makes an announcement to Dave who makes an announcement to me of a prefix, Andrew signs that announcement saying, I am I am sending this prefix to Dave so that and that prevents a spoof that pre pre prevents all sorts of other spoofs it prevents somebody else from saying I'm Andrew and I sent it here it is okay Dave signs further when he sends it to me 
signs and says, I'm taking this prefix, and, it, and Andrew's signature's on it, and I'm sending it to Randy. Okay, so we have the path. And to answer your question, I'm not sure I really care a lot about it, but at least when, you know, Vario hands it to Sprint, hands it to me, I know that part of the path was really intended and not spoofed, even if the prefix may not be one whose origin is registered. I would suggest that the origin registration is something that should be pushed, but you've at least got some knowledge that the last steps on the path are certified. Sort of follow up to that would be for those paths that are not authenticated, authorized, blessed, that they were indeed um, acceptable into the BGP mesh. Um, is there a point in the future where those who are not signed would be dropped and just assumed to be non-authoritative announcements, in which case there might be a fragmentation and everyone has to go through the process of adopting the SBGP, hence the flag day? That's far enough in the future that I don't think anyone has thought about that question yet. My guess is that it will never be enforced that you have to have only signed routes because we're not there yet. I could easily see some people, some parties, refusing to talk to you if you didn't, if it wasn't over a trusted path. Uh, but the, you know, the real important thing is to know authoritatively that a path is supposed to be uh, trusted. Let, let's face it, by the way, you're in an internet today where a large number of hosts refuse to, or sit behind routers that refuse to speak to a large number of other chunks of address space. I'm specifically speaking of the issue of the American military sh trying to pretend they're on half the internet. Steve Wilcox, um, very similar point actually. If you haven't got 100% rollout on this, surely small ISP over in Asia somewhere who's announcing through bigger ISPs gets to you eventually. If they announce you a more specific, it's not signed, but you've accepted it because you've had to because it's come through it. Uh, you're still going to have exactly the same problem, and it's more likely that you know someone like that is going to cause the problem anyway. So unless you've got a hundred percent rollout on this, it's never going to work. And how do you get hundred percent rollout? You've seen it with other systems; it's just so difficult to do. If you've got a small ISP that's you know, home to two big ISPs, the two big ISPs can be signing it and just not giving a certificate to the small ISP, and it's covered by the big ISP's signature. That should work. This is a business social issue, and we have the same, it's, it's a friend of who listens to what prefix lengths, et cetera, and, and I believe we will be in a point where we're not going to listen to, a, a large part of the net is not going to listen to uh, well authentic, uh, routes that are not well authenticated. A large number of mail servers are not going to accept email from um, clients who do not authenticate that email in reasonable ways to reduce spam, et cetera. We're going, the internet is going to tighten up. Hi, uh, my name's Tony Lee. Um, We've been having this discussion for the better part of five years. Um, we have a practical problem on our hands. I've heard somebody stand up and say that prefix hijacking is happening now and kind of tend to believe it. Um, why don't we just fix that? This is a non-trivial problem for us to fix, but this is the first step in getting it right. And we have a problem here. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is to have some secure mechanism for um, delegating IP address blocks. And I don't care if it's on CDs that get mailed out monthly, um, whatever mechanism it is, that's the absolute first thing that needs to happen. Any solution, SBGP, SOBGP, something no one else has thought of BGP, is going to re require Secure, you know, really good, reliable data on who owns what address blocks. I mean, that's the you know, SBGP came out of National Research Council study committee that Steve Kent and I were on. Steve Crocker was the original chair, and Steve McGeady was also on the committee. So we got uh, this slide seems appropriate. This cartoon seemed appropriate, but uh, 
the uh, Steve went off and worked on SBGP, but we can't. Yes, there is a problem. It is going to get worse. We need to start solving it about two years ago. Jeff Schiller, I'll save you the trouble of introducing yourself. Wow. Well, that sort of throws me for a loop. Um, the, uh, actually, these proposals do make an interesting change. Uh, you know, at the beginning of your talk, Steve, you said it doesn't change any of the business relationships, and I actually beg to differ because it changes the nature of the relationship with the routing registries and end users. Uh, right now, I hardly ever deal with my routing registry. Um, I don't have to. I got my address space. As long as I don't need to change anything, um, I'm fine. Certificates, on the other hand, have this thing called an expiration date. Uh, and you have to make sure you get a new one before the old one expires. Uh, and that process has to work well. And in any customer service situation I've been in, if you're dealing with a monopoly, it's not fun. Um, so I'm not saying we have to throw away SBGP or SOBGP, but I think we need to make be careful about how the business and relationships work and the trust relationships. Um, for example, you know, not to go into all the details, but I'd be very happy if those digital certificates were actually created by my ISP, because I have a business relationship with my ISP that it's in my ISP's interest to maintain. In the case of the routing registries, they don't care. I mean, they don't have to. I have nobody else to go to. Uh, and I can give you numerous examples where, well, just, you know, for example, this is not a routing registry, but it's a DNS registry. Um, my, you know, contact data for MIT.edu was, was fouled and unchangeable for five years because I couldn't get anybody to pay attention to fix a broken system that they had, and it only got fixed when they became competition for registering things. And so I can easily predict cases where you can't seem to get that certificate renewed because there's some bureaucratic foul up over here, and meantime, a clock is ticking, tick, 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 tick. I think slamming VeriSign is kind of the operator's equivalent of Godwin's invocation. So next, um, let's cut it off at uh, Peter because we do want to finish the panel. OK, so I'm Peter Lofberg. Um, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure we are getting things in the right order. This seems to be something that needs to be fixed. But we have another similar thing in, in the internet that I would like to see working first. That's called Secure DNS. Because that has all the same kind of ingredients, has all the same kind of problems. And if they are further down the, the path, they even have a protocol in the IETF. And damn it, why can't you make that work to start with? I'd love to. I strongly agree. That same NRC committee I mentioned said there were two major threats to the internet. The other one was DNS. I'm uh, Alvaro Retana. I work for Cisco. I do routing. Uh, the link down there, if you can copy it real quick, that's where the slides are at right now. They won't be there uh, much longer, but if you want to follow uh, with this, you can you know, get them. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about SOBGP. We have um, many of the same objectives, of course, and are coming from many of the same or the same threat models as uh, everyone else. Uh, what is different is the way we are proposing to do things, uh, pretty much. So we all know the, the internet is very important. It ties everything together. We all know it's uh, vulner vulnerable to many things. Um, and uh, the reason why we're one of the reasons we're here to talk about both SBGP and SOPGP is because this solution requires end-to-end -end agreement versus many parts of, re of the overall. Uh, security of the internet that are point solutions that can be deployed on a router per router or peer uh, per peer or session per session basis. Things like inbound filters, maximum routes, uh, any other uh, router specific implementation enhancements, also including things that are not part of uh, the protocol itself, like uh, securing a compromised router, which does affect the protocol and does affect the system, but is at least in my opinion, of course, outside 
uh, the realm of uh, the protocol and what the protocol should protect. The other part of it is the transport connection. Uh, we, in our work, don't mention or don't uh, make reference to using IPsec or MD5 or anything else because what we believe is that is one of those other mechanisms that can be used to protect part of the whole system. We are not in any moment uh, against using IPsec or anything else. Uh, in fact, you know, use whatever you want. Uh, SOBGP and the part that I'm talking about here and the part about um, verifying the origin, authenticating the path, et cetera, that SBGP also covers works over IPsec or non-IPsec. So SOBGP is trying to solve the problem of validating that an autonomous system is in fact authorized to originate mm -hmm. a prefix. And by doing that, we also, uh, uh, we also can verify that the path is a valid path to the origin of the advertisement. So we started down this road by putting ourselves some design requirements. Um, and these are, these are some of them. Uh, one of them is we want to take advantage of the existing uh, internet architecture, the trust relationships that already exist, uh, the way uh, addresses are, for example, assigned and delegated from ISPs to customers down, et cetera. We want to, of course, impact as uh, the least we can the current protocol and the current system. So the objective has been minimum changes to the protocol as much as we can and try to optimize memory and processing requirements. We don't want to rely on any central authority to do anything. So as I talk further, you'll see that what we're proposing is a distributed system that has implicit trust uh, in it. We don't want to rely, or we should never rely on routing to secure routing. Uh, what I mean there is if I have to go someplace using my BGP routes to verify that my BGP routes are secure, it kind of creates a circle of trying to get someplace without uh, verification that the route to get there is actually valid. Uh, we wanted, of course, and I'm sure everyone wants it to be incrementally deployed. Part of uh, importance here is that if it is incrementally or partially deployed, you have to provide some type of security to the parts of the system that have implemented uh, the security mechanism. Uh, deployment flexibility, on or off box, for example, crypto, uh, crypto, cryptography uh, processing, which is another uh, important thing. And uh, the last part here, uh, flexibility, so that each operator, each autonomous system can configure their uh, the size security level and uh, overhead and uh, conversion speed, for example. Uh, this last point is important as well because today we all know that there are 25,000 different BGP knobs and everyone has uh, the ability to implement them independent of everyone else. So what SOPGP does, and uh, over, the last, over, over the next uh, couple of slides, I'm gonna just summarize what we do. We verify uh, that the originator is in fact uh, authorized to originate a path or a route. We can verify that the S path represents a valid path to that origin. What we do is we have one extension to BGP, which is a new security message. This is not an attribute, it's a message. So what this means is it's carried separate from the updates. And it can result, as I'll say a couple times later again, it can result in you having a BGP session that only carries updates, or a session that only carries uh, security information, or a session that carries both. Uh, the point here is that we want to carry the certificate and security information inside the protocol itself so that, again, we don't have to rely on external sources uh, to get that. We, uh, it has uh, fixed additional scalability requirements. Uh, the certificates and security information is generated once per entity, what we call an entity is an autonomous system, and per block allocated or assigned. This means the system doesn't grow in memory requirements as the number of prefixes uh, increases. Six advantages, as I mentioned before, truth, uh, trust relationship, loose AS associations, et cetera. So we're, we'll, we're proposing a web of trust to uh, validate this, the signatures and the certificates. 
So if I want to trust my ISP, I can trust my ISP. If I want to trust uh, IANA or some registry, I can trust IANA or some registry, uh, whatever I want to do. Uh, there are three certificates that we have defined so far. Uh, the entity certificate, which is used to uh, establish the identity. So this is uh, the, the information that, ca that is carried around to say, yes, I am, in fact, AS number 109, uh, et cetera. The authorization certificate, which is the one that delegates or the one that, that shows that a specific autonomous system is, in fact, authorized to advertise a specific prefix. Usually, this is going to be signed by someone who has authority over that prefix. Again, ISP, registry, you know, whoever you want, uh, whoever you trust. And then there's a policy certificate. Uh, we're going to use the certificate for a couple of things. One is to carry what we call a topology map that we're going to use later so that we can verify the path. And the other one is if the origin wants to apply specific policies to their block or a specific prefix, they can, uh, they can announce those policies in here and, of course, sign the policies uh, and make them secure. Some policies may be things like, uh, you know, I have a slash 16 and, and the biggest block that I'm going to advertise is 24s. So no one, even if they actually spoof the origin, could uh, advertise anything bigger than a slash 24, for example. And uh, again, we're proposing a robot trust uh, as a method to do this. And uh, last but not least, least of course, uh, built-in flexibility. As I mentioned, you can propagate updates or certificates together or decouple the, propagating, the propagation of them so that you don't overload routers uh, with uh, certificate information. You can have on or off, off box uh, cryptography operations, incremental deployable, configuration, etc. So I mentioned we have a separate uh, message. We call it the BGP security message. And this is how we're going to transport the certificates. Uh, all, this, all the security message is, is a set of TLBs. Each TLB represents a certificate that you carry and you exchange with your peers. Via a simple TLB message, you can add other certificates if you want later. It also means you can only receive the certificates that you need. Every time you exchange this information with your peers, you don't have to get everything again. You can only get uh, some of them. And uh, the last point down there, which uh, I've known, I know I've said several times, but it's important, is you can have certificate only, update only, or both sessions. Of course, everything is negotiated, start up with the capability as uh, everything else. The important part about the security message is there is no information inside an update. So there is no additional processing need or storage for anyone receiving an update even though it is secured by SOGP because the information is carried uh, separately. So this is one, my one slide uh, that explains the whole system. So I'm going to go through it. So what we start with is a set of known keys, uh, your ISP, for example, you know, known keys that you have, uh, the match ASs. As uh, entity certificates are received, we can validate from the known keys as the signature is actually valid, and in there, you, of course, uh, have uh, identity of other ASs and their keys as well. So your table of keys, uh, et cetera, grows. Policy certificates carry two things. They carry two policy information. And what this is is a list of other ASs that you're connected to. This is no more and sometimes actually less information that, than what it is propagated today in the AS path of a route. There is no specific information about peering, types, or addresses of peers, or nothing like that, just the yeses. So this goes into what we call a topology database, which later turns to be a topology graph, not a tree, a graph. Uh, the idea here is we can then validate, doing a simple two-way connectivity check, and say, yes, A is one, says connected to two, and two says connected to one, yeah, that has to exist. This also lets uh, people implicitly withdraw routes by announcing that the connection doesn't exist. So if my connection to my ISP went down and my ISP turns out to be a bad guy and they keep advertising my uh, announcement, my update, I can always send a new topology map through my alternate uh, multi-home ISP uh, announcing that that link is not valid anymore. 
The other part of the, of the policy goes into what we call a policy database. The authorization certificate, of course, has uh, signatures again that say uh, this AS is authorized to advertise net slash eight or whatever. Uh, there is a very tight bond between the authorization database and the policy database so that policies get applied to addresses that are announced, that are authorized to be announced, and uh, vice versa. So this is uh, pretty much the pre-work or, or the work that has to be done uh, cryptographically, um, resolving all the keys, looking up all the information, etc. When the actual update comes in, uh, there is no crypto processing of the updates. The assumption is, of course, the topology graph and the authorization database may be pre-built. So all we need to do is two things. We check the origin and the prefix against the authorization database. We've got an update from AS1 for 10 slash 8. Check it there. See authorized or not, yes or no, whatever. And then we can check the AS path against the topology graph and figure out if that path is, in fact, a valid path uh, to the destination. Um, if you actually downloaded the slides, I just skip 10 slides of what you have down there. I just want to show a quick um, example of uh, some deployment scenario. This is uh, a simple network, and uh, what I'm trying to illustrate is the 7007 problem. So the problem was 7007 deaggregated everything back into the internet. So the way that happened was they just deaggregated and announced stuff as originated from them. The way SOBGP prevents this is very simple. The origin of the routes is now 7007. Authorization certificates say, nope, they are not the ones authorized to do this, so we can just get rid of all the routes. Another possibility, which wasn't what happened but could have happened, is let's say that 7007 in fact announced an AS path of the origin and then themselves so that when we look at the databases, we find out, oh yeah, the origin is authorized to announce this. But when we verify the path, uh, the path is not valid because there is no link between the origin and 7007. So that gets uh, blocked at the first hop uh, ISP. Another thing that could have happened um, that we can also protect against is the fact, uh, let's say that 7007 was actually multi-homed and that they just kept the original AS path and propagated the information back to the multi-home ISP, which I call ISPM. So the AS path is the same as the original one that they received, um, which means we can verify the path. We can also verify the origin. So here's where some of the uh, functionality of the policy certificate comes in. There are a couple of things we can do here. One of them is there is uh, a uh, bit indication in the policy certificate that indicates uh, this AS is a non-transit AS. ISPs can use it for the customers that they want to. The other option is if you don't include that connection in your topology information that prevents the autonomous system from transiting your routes. So if I was an ISP, I would probably not want many of my routes to go through my uh, customers, cable customers, for example, or you know anything else. The other way that this can be prevented is, uh, knowing this was a deaggregation problem, is uh, by the origin advertising a policy that says, I'm only advertising slash 16s, uh, if you got anything bigger than that, even if it's from me, ignore it, uh, et cetera. So what do we need to run SOBGP? Of course, SOBGP software. We need uh, the infrastructure to generate certificates, uh, very similar to what uh, SOBGP needs. Uh, we need, of course, certificates from other people that uh, authorize us to advertise the route. It's going to be ISPs, uh, registries, uh, whoever you trust. And then you need to propagate these messages, these certificates, in BGP using the new uh, security message. So right now, uh, there's some drafts. Uh, yes, they're expired. Um, we plan to update them before the next ITF, uh, next month in uh, Vienna. We're working on the specific format for all the certificate, which are going to be XO9 type certificates uh, of the specific uh, mechanisms for PKI, et cetera. All that is in progress. And uh, we're working on some of the code for iOS. One of the goals here, because of the offload processing and the fact that we don't need to necessarily store everything in the router, is to 
be able to run this on existing hardware. Note that I put some asterisks there. Of course, that's a big um, if, uh, but that's one of the goals that we have. If uh, you want, I ran out of time. If you want any more information, there is a website. There is a mailing list that anyone and everyone is welcome to participate in. And uh, there's a lot of discussions not only on SOBGP, but on SBGP as well and other security stuff in the RPSAC working group in ITF. That's it. Hey, we're running a little, sorry, low on time, so let me <clears throat> just throw one summary up and then let's uh, do the questions. Then I think people are concerned about lunch. Um, needless to say, um, there are things that I think about both protocols suck. Um, for those who know me wouldn't be surprised by this. Um, <clears throat> Tell us what you really think, Randy. <laughs> Um, but I do think we have the problem, and I want to steal from both of them. Um, I won't really go into what I think sucks about each of them, but um, let me instead, instead suggest what I might like to steal from each of them. And this is my personal view, okay? The big costs in all this are going to be my deployment my operational costs, not um, what Aaron's going to have to do to sign something or the cost of a little hardware in the router. Okay? Full deployment's going to take years. What I don't want to do is get caught out. Okay? It's going to be very hard to explain to my management three years from now when we have serious internet outages to the BGP problems or next month when we have the next 7,007 or whatever, why I'm not doing anything. Why I didn't already do something about this and I'm not prepared to do something, okay? The deployment we can do now is the beginning of the certificate creation and distribution. And that it comes in two parts. It's the address allocation certificates. In other words, the registry gives it to an ISP, gives it to, an, you know, those are signed certificates. And there's the peer certificates. Hey, I trust Dave, Dave trusts Andrew, etc. I believe those are two different trust models. Both can, both can use the same flavor of certificate. It's how the attestation chain of the certificates are done. I believe the peers are really more like PGP and the uh, address allocation is a, a hierarchy. Um, and I believe the hardware support, we can ask for our vendors to start throwing those chips in now. I believe we should start trying to sign the origins now. In other words, hey, 1239 is authorized to add to announce route prefix X. I believe we can use the registry based, in other words, IANA to RIPE and Aaron and APNIC and LATNIC to the ISPs certifying that those addresses are in fact allocated, those prefixes are allocated now. I believe we can start building trust relationships with our peers. I am willing to pay for the hardware now. It's going to cost me $500 a router for routers that I'm paying $500,000 for. You know, I can afford that tenth of a percent increment so management doesn't string me up three years from now when I have to turn it on. Okay? But what I most care about is that I have one planned protocol path and not something I'm going to do this year and then I'm going to have to do something more three years from now when I realize the threat is bigger. Somebody else have their prejudices? Uh, Steve Wilcox again. Um, okay, I kind of agree with what you're saying. What can we do now? As it currently stands, there's registries that you can register routes in, 
people aren't doing it. As it currently stands, everybody could register their routes and everyone could do prefix filtering on their customers and peers and they could validate that every route that you receive is stored somewhere, even without the PKI and all that kind of stuff. We don't have anything like that right now. Well, you know, you could push on that today without having to update the technology. I can't validate large peers with, based on routing registry data. The routers won't handle it. But the routers, routers will handle this? <laughs> um, I believe they will be able to, yes. Actually, when you actually look at, um, for instance, SBGP, you will find the change in computation is merely the crypto load, especially when signing forward, and the chips are commodity junk now. So, so 10 years ago, ANS did inter provider route filtering, and the headache was that that you got, uh, you know, you had to wait. There wasn't a route refresh, so you, you know, mechanism, so you had to bounce a route, and you had to wait on a registry to be updated. Today, we have incremental access lists. We have uh, route refresh. You have, you know, I mean, the, the missing part to every one of these solutions is some central authority or RIR or someone to delegate and say, this network owns this prefix, and they're, you know, they're authoritative for it. If you have that and inter provider route filtering, it fixes 99% of the problems that, you know, that would arise. And we could do that today without any new hardware. Um, I don't think the new hardware is the problem. I think it's the infrastructure, and the people, and the deployment costs. Yes, and that's going to be two orders of magnitude larger for SOBGP or SVGP. I think it would be great if this were deployed. But my, my point is that we don't have MD5, we don't have inter provider route filters, and th those alone would fix a, a very, very large piece of this problem. Um, yep. So. But it's not going to fix all of it. Yeah, no, I agree, but, you know, 99% of the problem is better than uh, nothing, so. <laughs> Jeff Schiller again. What this actually can do, with, which all the other, pro you know, things cannot do, is this can be forced on us. And that's actually a good thing. Right now, I can't force an ISP to set passwords on their routers. I cannot force an ISP to use halfway decent and to do MD5 keying on BGP sessions. I can't control beyond my peers and myself. But on the other hand, I can choose to only accept signed routes. Now, obviously, you can't do that on day one. But after the technology's been available and the infrastructure's been available, some number of years have gone by, the major providers can say, effective date X, we will only accept signed routes. And that's something you can do with this. You can't do with any of the other technologies that are out there. It won't be fun. So, so, so to that, actually, I don't know how many service provider or how many folks in here have worked for a service provider that said, stop reachability of those destinations. But I don't think that a flag day like that's actually even you know remotely realistic, because people, you know, there's there's revenue and real income associated with that. And that's what you know keeps those companies running. So that's not that's not feasible. And there's cost and real outflow for dealing with security breaches and support when things break. But yeah, it's that's going to be a tough call. We're years away from even being in a position to decide if we want to make that call. You know, what's likely to happen sooner is some group of customers will only deal with a collection of ISPs that have adequate routing security because they want to deal, they want to make sure that the places they want to get to are the right places. And uh, I don't know if we're going to need the flag day, but I can say, yes, this is a route I can trust because of the following attributes that I can see on my BGP speaking router at my ends on my customer premises. This is your router without security. Hey, I, was I, 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 I see your tail circuit, Jeff. <laughs> Any pre-launch announcements, uh, Ms. Harris? <laughs>